Okay, we have about 50 people to join. If you um, want to wait a bit longer, if you want to go ahead. Well, let us start. So people who have been joining on time, you know, to don't make them wait any longer. Okay, so go ahead and... Okay, well, thanks so much for all for all of you to join in, in this talk to, of Professor Margarita Lopez Maya. Thanks so much, Patricia Alba, for helping organize this. Um, this is going to be one of the last events of the semester at the Center for Latin American Studies. And since we're going to start to, I mean, we cannot travel, we're going to be stuck at home in a very long summer. So what I propose to do, and I will send you information about that, is to have conversatorios and lectures online throughout the summer so we can have discussions, conversations, and we keep in touch with each other. Today, we have the honor of having with us Dr. Margarita Lopez Maya. She's the 2020 Bacardi Family Eminent Scholar at the Center. Dr. Lopez Maya is an historian by training, and she's the most foremost authority, the most important authority, I think, on the Bolivarian Revolution. She has gained many fellowships to recognize her work. She was visiting fellow at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. She was a senior fellow at the Weaver Wilson International Center for Scholars. And she was the Andres Bello Fellow at St. Anthony's College at Oxford. She has been teaching courses in very prestigious universities in the Americas, for instance, in Columbia, the University of Oxford, and the University of Princeton. She has published extensively in any edited, in most edited volumes on Chavismo. You will have an article by her. And I will mention only one of some of her uh, recent books Venezuela del Viernes Negro al Referendo Revocatorio, Democracia Participativa en Venezuela, and El Ocaso del Chavismo. Uh, we were very fortunate to have her teaching a seminar here at the Center for Latin American Studies. The course was entitled Democracy in Latin America, Representative, Participative, or Populist. And this also concludes her class. Uh, it's also going to be the last session of her class. We're going to have a conference to honor her work and to reflect on what happened to the left, to the populist left in Latin America. And the title of the conference is What Went Wrong with the Left in Latin America? We had to postpone, of course, the conference for January 2021, and Dr. Lopez will deliver the key speech. So after having her uh, for a semester here at the center, we were very lucky to have her back in the month of January for this very important conference. So I will not say, talk any longer, and please let me welcome Margarita Lopez Maya. So, well, good afternoon to all of you. It is really my pleasure to be able to intervene today in this presentation and this conference that is at the same time, the last session of my, of my seminar here at the University of Florida at the Center of Latin American Studies. I have been here since January. I have been, I would, I have been giving a seminar like Carlos de la Torre said, on democracy in Latin America, representative, participative, or populist, which is the best. <laughs> what do we do with the, all these kinds of modalities of democracy that are going on in our region? I want to thank Carlos de la Torre for this invitation. I want to thank the Center for Latin American Studies at the, at the University of Florida for having distinguished me with this fellowship and giving me the opportunity to stay here. I was caught here with the coronavirus and so I will be staying here for a little while more. So what I want to do today is as, a, as the last session of my class and also as a conference, it's, it's kind of a hybrid here, is to use many of the concepts, some of the insights that we had during our sessions in class to understand the Venezuelan situation. As many of you know, Venezuela was in the 20th century, one of the most uh, successful modernized societies. And it was also one of the richest countries of the, of the hemisphere. But what has happened today, it's, as many of you may know by the news or because you are Venezuelans or because you, you, you follow 
the situation in Latin America is that today Venezuela is one of the poorest, unstable countries of the region. It is competing with Haiti. It's competing with the small economies. And it is one of the most dangerous and violent countries of, of, the, of, of Latin America. Actually, some people call it already a failed state and poverty has, has, is, is rampant. So what happened in Venezuela? What I am going to try to do today is using actually the theory of democracy, the different kinds of modalities of democracy is to try to address what happened in Venezuela, giving my interpretation, of course, this is a very controversial situation. It is very polarized and even in the academia, of course, in the political realm and in the news also, but I will be giving my interpretation of this of what happened in Venezuela. And I have called this, this, this session, Venezuela, populism, extractivism, and socialism of the 21st century, trying to put together what is my interpretation of the tragedy that the Venezuelans, us the Venezuelans are living today. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give some initial statements, which means that these are statements that I am not going to develop extensively because I wouldn't have time to do it. I have that in other papers. I have, there is literature about this. The first thing I think that is for me important to say, uh, my, my students will remember some of the literature we did at the beginning of the session of, of our classes of the seminar, is that Latin America seems to have a tension between representative liberal democracy and populism. And that this has been going on at least until since, from, since the 19th century, when the colonies of Spain broke with Spain and started building the republics. Uh, there has been a great effort done by these societies to try to build a robust democracy, a liberal uh, representative democracy. But again and again, these uh, democracies are interrupted by the the intervention of populist politics. And so some people call it like Paul Drake, this is a pendulum that goes from restricted democracy to popular democracy. And he has a, wonder, a wonderful title for one of his books that is called Between Tyranny and Anarchism. So how much liberties can Latin America have before it doesn't fall into anarchy? How much rules do they have to impose without coming throwing Latin America into authoritarianism. And this seems to be a dilemma that still is not resolved in Latin America. And I would argue to begin this conference that at the end of the 20th century, that dilemma, that historic tension between liberal representative democracy and populism resulted in a populist rupture in Venezuela. Venezuela was having, had, had, was dragging its feet with a very long uh, crisis and that crisis was resolved uh, at that moment to a populist rupture. But 20 years later, whatever happened in, this, in these 20 years brought Venezuela to its feet. Venezuela today is suffering a structural crisis in a complex humanitarian emergency, according to the United Nations. So why is this? I will argue here that this, that this, that Venezuela is today in what we can consider a structural crisis combined or expressed through this complex humanitarian emergency that since 2017 has been declared by the United Nations. What do I mean by a structural crisis? The crisis in Venezuela did not begin with Chavez and with Chavismo. The crisis in Venezuela is a structural crisis and the deepest, the core of that crisis lays in a modern, uh, in a model of economy that the literature knows as a rentier economy, as a modernization through an oil rentier economy. This, this model of rentism today, more known as extractivism economy, was very successful for several decades in, in, in Venezuela and brought Venezuela to one of the most envied modernizations of the hemisphere. However, this model began to show its problems, its structural problems, already in the decade of the 80s. 
and it was never solved by the elites at that time. It kept on moving throughout the 80s and the 90s, covered the whole spheres of, so of the society, the economic the, the failure to overcome this model and bring Venezuela into a more healthy economy uh, would produce uh, a crisis very similar to the crisis that we are living today. Of course, the one that we are living today is, 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 is a higher scale of what we saw in the 80s and the 90s. But in the 80s and the 90s, we saw, high, uh, we saw inflation, unemployment, scarcity of, of, of food, scarcity of goods, discontent, uh, uh, widening of, the po of poverty, so on and so forth. And that crisis tried to resolve with the emergence of this populist leader and a new uh, social political movement. What do I mean by a rentier economy? Venezuela, many of you may know, uh, does, does not have what you can probably call a modern economy. It is an oil country. It has been an oil country now for almost, for almost a century. It, it, it society has been shaped by oil. His state has been shaped by oil. And his economy, the characteristic basic of this economy is that it always has needed the oil revenues to be able to develop the industrialization and modernization process that it had. The oil revenues come in from the international market. They are due to the prices of the oil in the international markets. The international oil markets have cycles of boom and bust. When the cycle is in a boom moment, Venezuela, a huge amount of currency comes in the country and then the economy flourishes and it, it seems as though everything is possible. When the bus comes, the, the, the dollars, the petrodollars drop and Venezuela begins a huge process of crisis. This is what is happening today is not the first time that it happens, but it does reveal that there is a structural economic problem in Venezuela that is the heart of the crisis and that Chavismo did not recognize nor addressed and left that problem intact. If it did anything, it worsened that problem and brought us to where we are today. The, the last cycle of, of boom and bust began in 2004. That when the prosperity of the high oil prices began, it was the longest historically speaking. It finished by 2014. And during those 10 years, the structural economic problem was hidden by the, uh, the avalanche of, of petrodollars that came into the country. And it looked as though the project of Hugo Chavez Frias, this socialism of the 21st century was going to be a success. But as soon as the, the, the bust part of the cycle came in, the, 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 the petrodollars dried out, the country was again in its economic structural crisis but much worse than it had been because it had passed 10, it had passed all these years without uh, acknowledging the problem, without addressing it. And if anything it had done, it had exacerbated their entire economy, their entire society and the petrol state. This, uh, this, this is the hard layer, so to say the core of the structural crisis in Venezuela, but this was worsened during these years of Chavismo with a combination of an exercise of, po of, of, of power, exercise of power through populism, populist means, and through an ideology that has been called socialism of the 21st century. The combination of the needle combination of these three things, in my opinion, had this deepened this crisis in Venezuela, spread it to all spheres of Venezuela society, and it has produced the tragedy that we are looking at today. Let's see some of the expressions of this structural crisis very, very quickly. Venezuela has suffered many times, this is not the first time, what has been called by economists a Dutch disease. The Dutch disease was, was discovered by the Dutch, that's why it's called by that in the 70s. And, it, and to make it very simple, because I am not an economist, right? Uh, when the, in these um, extractivist economies where you rely on a very important product of the, for the international markets, like the case of oil in Venezuela, when the, when the prices go up, the country receives a huge amount of currency, of dollars in the case of Venezuela, which 
kind of flooded the economy of the country. It, oh, it's going to overvalue the domestic currency, the Bolivar. And if it, can, if it continues throughout some times, months or years, like what's the case with this last boom of, of oil uh, uh, during the Chavista era, what happens is that it becomes more and more difficult for the domestic production to compete with international prices. Of, and so the country begins to import everything and dismantle their economy. And that was basically what happened in Venezuela by the year 2008. Prices were way, very high, were the highest historically speaking uh, of, the, of, the, of different boom cycles that, uh, of oil that have been going on in the international market. And since Chavista, Chavismo, Hugo Chavez did not recognize that the problem in Venezuela was a structural problem, a structural economic problem. He blamed his enemies as a, as a good populist would do. He blamed the, he blamed the United States, capitalism, the, the, the Colombian government, the, the, the businessmen in Venezuela, whatever. And so he could not acknowledge a, a problem he, he, would not, he would not recognize as such. And so they have left this Dutch disease go on forever. Will, uh, the, the, the bust of the oil, when the, when the prices of oil went down, starting 2014, the currency dried out, the inside domestic production had, had been reduced, there was no capacity to produce, to, to fulfill the needs of the Venezuelans for food, for medicines, for, for clothing, for the, the factories, whatever. And so Venezuela started to suffer more and more difficult problems of scarcity of goods. And there was not enough money to import them anymore. And this has been going on now for more than seven, it has been, it has been going on for six years, seven years. And the result of that you can see in the economy, the dictator today, Nicolas Maduro has not either recognized for him, it is a problem of the United States and the empire, the evils of the world that are against the beautiful product of socialism of the 21st century. And so what we are living today as an expression of this crisis is seven years of economic recession, a GDP that has shrunk 70% of what it was four years ago, five years ago. That means that Venezuela's production today is, is, is around what it was in 1949, 1950, when we weren't 30 million Venezuelans, but we were probably seven or eight million. This is our third year of hyperinflation. In 2018, inflation rocketed to a 1,800,000%, which um, uh, has been one of the highest in the history of the world. We compete there with some of those huge, uh, high hyperinflation suffered during the Second World War from some countries and Zimbabwe and some African countries too. The result of that, because the dictator and the, 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 the people in power today do not acknowledge this as, as a problem that they have to resolve, has been that this has been going on now for three years. And as a result of that, and for the survivors, dollarization has come upon Venezuela, but it isn't a planned dollarization. It's, it is a chaotic dollarization that has been permitted by the Venezuelan government that knows that if he doesn't do that, the results are, are going to be even worse than what they are. Of course, and hyperinflation by that means that the salaries will become, become dust. They have been pulverized. I can tell you, say my case, that was one of the highest salaries as a, as a high rank professor of a public university that I could have had in, in my best years a salary of $1,500, $1,800. Today, it amounts to around $8 a month. So today, anybody that has, it has their income coming in with the domestic currency cannot meet his basic needs. Uh, the minimum wage is, is around $2. Um, at the same time, it, the, the, the oil company was disattended, was used for other purposes, for purposes to serve this socialist project of Hugo Chavez Frias and his successor, Nicolas Maduro. And as a result of that, today Venezuela produces less than a third that it produced uh, before Chavez took power. Venezuela was, at the end of the 20th century, producing 3,300,000, barrels a day. Today, it doesn't produce more than 600,000 barrels a day. 
and its big refineries, once the, the pride of Venezuela, it had one of the refinery complex, the biggest in the world, the refinerias de Paraguaná, today are paralyzed and we are not refining our crude. We do not have oil. Public transportation has collapsed due to the, to the lack of gasoline in the country. What does the United Nations mean when it says that Venezuela has, is undergoing a complex humanitarian emergency since 2017? This was picked up by the Universal Periodical Report that went out in 2017 and 2018. And I don't know if it, I, I haven't seen the, if it, it was published already for 2019. But what they, but this is a, a concept that means that the complex, that the, that the crisis that Venezuela is undergoing has spread to all its spheres of life and has destroyed all those spheres of life. It has the capacity to destroy the economy that has destroyed the social fabric. It has unstable the political regime. It has collapsed the social services very much as if it had gone through a very aggressive war. Here are some photos of the people asking for basic needs like water, like food, like human rights, like uh, uh, gas, and so on. To give you an example, Venezuela, when Chavez went into power, remember that I said it was a, it was a very severe crisis that we were living and that was resolved through the a populist rupture. Venezuela had 48% of poor families, according to, to, to the line of poverty by income. This was, this had jumped from a 24, 25% of families five years before, seven years before, 248 from more than half of the family, more than half of the population was in poverty. And that was one of the explanations that why Chavez won in 1998, the, uh, the presidential uh, election. However, last year, according to surveys done by Three, uni three universities of Venezuela, because the Venezuelan government, one of the solutions it has found to, to, to try to resolve the crisis is to hide and not put out the numbers. These, these universities have been trying now since 2017 to put numbers and to use the, method the methodology, the methods that today, because we don't have today official data, the government refused to give official data is that today our poverty line is above 87, 90% of the families. Because anybody that has a salary in Bolivares is poor today, including myself with a, with a seven, $8 a month salary. I cannot be anything else but poor. People have to rely on if they have the possibility of having a salary in dollars, some companies, uh, external companies, foreign companies give their employees salaries and dollars, the, the few companies that are there. Some people have savings outside the country and they use them. Some people have remittances of their families that send them $50, $80, $100 a month. And if you don't have those dollars, you are in extreme poverty. You, don't ha you can't make ends meet to, to, to put food on your table. This was shown also in this survey that's called in COVID by the weight loss of the Venezuelans in, in 2017, it was of 11 kilos. That is more or less 24, 25 pounds. In average, Venezuelans lost in the year 2017, 60% of the Venezuelans answered that they had lost in, in average around 24, 25 kilos that, uh, pounds that year. And in 2018, they spoke of losing around 20 pounds. So this is a very, uh, very vivid image of the scarcity of the difficulty or there is scarcity of food or more lately there has been impossibility to access the food due to the prices that are in dollars in the, econ in the dollarized economy that is developing at, at, at right now. The minimum wage today doesn't get doesn't reach two dollars a month and to give you an idea of the incapacity of the people to meet any kind of, of uh, unsatisfying basic needs a box of aspirins, if you, if you can find them, would be around $6 the box. So as you see, it, it is really a very severe situation. There are also NGOs that have emerged or have been strengthened in these years of such hardships, trying to put together some official numbers in order to uh, confront 
the, the, the health situation problem that we have in Venezuela. And according to this national survey of hospitals that is, that is being, um, uh, that isn't it being, it being elaborated by uh, uh, an organization of doctors in the hospitals that put together the information uh, that is more or less reliable. I would say this is, this is the best quality that we have. Um, in 2019, they found that 1,557 persons had died in, in public hospitals in Venezuela due to the supply failures of medicines, equipment, therapy rooms, some by cardiovascular traumas, other severe injuries, energy failures, and the like. According to the Venezuelan Pharmaceutical uh, Federation too, they have been putting out their numbers of the scarcity of medicine, and in depending on the month, depending on, 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 on the week, sometimes it's between, it's between 70, 80, or more than 80% the scarcity of medicines. Also, according to the observatory, the, the NGO that has been for many, uh, I would say 20 years at least, uh, following the, 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 the violent indicators in Venezuela, Venezuela has positioned itself since last year as the most violent country of the hemisphere, uh, <laughs> taking that place away from Haiti. And Caracas has been considered the most dangerous capital of the world with a homicide rate of 90 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Many of these and other numbers and testimonies you can find in the United Nations in the office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Uh, the High Commissioner was able to go to Venezuela last year, he was able to see in, in situ what was going on. She was brought, many testimonies was brought. She was able to, to talk to people that had been violated in their more basic human rights, prisoners, political persecute, and so on. And she also spoke, of course, with people of the government that said that they had been violated their human rights by the opposition. And she put out a very important report last year. You can find it in the internet. You can find, she put also two other oral reports, uh, one this year too. So there you can find much more indicators of the uh, the humanitarian emergency, the complex humanitarian emergency that Venezuela is in. And the most vivid, I think, images, of course, this also said by the uh, High Officer of Human Rights, uh, Ex-President Michel Bachelet, today Venezuela, more than four million and a half Venezuelans have fled the country, due basically for socioeconomic reasons, but also because of the insecurity, the violence, the, and the political persecution. This is an image that I'd like to put on, on in my classes because this is the bridge that connects uh, Colombia with Venezuela at the level of the cities of San Antonio del Táchira and Venezuela and Cúcuta in Colombia. This is the most transit bridge uh, between this huge border. This, this border was closed by um, Nicolás Maduro in 2015 arguing that the government of Colombia wanted to overthrow him, was unstable in him, was trying to kill him. That was the time of President Santos. And the situation went off for months. The people were desperate because, they, they were because of the scarcity of medicines and food. And so all, a, 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 a women's movement popped up. They dressed in white. They went to the bridge and they started pushing those military soldiers there of the Guardia Nacional. And they pushed them and they pushed them and they talked to them until thankfully somebody called and said, let those women pass because there's gonna be a massacre here if we don't. And so they let the women pass. And the result was that, that, the, that the border was open that weekend. And this is the photo of the people traveling through the bridge to go to Colombia to do the shopping of food that had for months been closed. This, I like to put it because this happened in July, 2016, much before the sanctions, restrictions, and all kinds of things that now Nicolás Maduro blamed for the, for the crisis in Venezuela had happened. Hmm. So let's go more into detail of the causes of this, of all this dramatic situation that Venezuela is living. My mind argument, as I said, is that the structural crisis is a result of the exacerbation of the extractivist or rentier economy with the populist charismatic exercise of power. 
And I do, I would argue that socialism of the 21st century is not the main course of this crisis. I think it is the ideology that kind of justifies and legitimizes this popular exercise of power that has destroyed Venezuela's democratic institutions in the name of a set of beliefs that are totalitarian in nature. So let's go into that. I have already talked about what a rentier economy meant, the vulnerable, uh, the vulnerability of Venezuela's economy throughout the 20th century on the oil prices in the international market and how this had had several cycles. It had a cycle after the Second World War. It had a cycle during the 70s with Carlos Andres Perez, his first government. And it had a, again a boom and bust cycle with Hugo Chavez, which is the longest in time of all the cycles that Venezuela has had throughout his, his economic history. The windfall gains of this, um, of this oil boom that began in 2004, I would argue that re re revised again, something that a Venezuelan anthropologist observed already during the first administration of Carlos Andres Perez between 1973 and 1979. And he came up with this concept of the magical state. This, uh, what, is, what does the magical state say? I think this was revived by, by Hugo Chavez Diaz and uh, the movement that sur surrounded him. This is a, a state where the, the income coming in that comes into the national executive is the one that, uh, that receives the income coming in from the oil prices because the, 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 the oil company is a state company. And so the, the oil revenues come in through the national executive. And from there, they are distributed to the, to the economy and to the society. It has, brings several characteristics that are different from more, more used, more, more normal kinds of states. This is a Pedro state. And what Fernando Coronil in the Magical State book of the 90s says is that the amount of dollars is of such dimension, among other things, he says, that it, to say it in my words, it intoxicated those people that are in power. If they believe that they can do anything with the society that they have there, they think all the desires, all their dreams can come true. And so they try to shape the society according to their desires. Uh, Fernando Coroni saw this happen in the 70s with the oil boom of 1973-1974 when Carlos Andres Perez tried to push the industrial substitution importation model to its, to its limits and brought Venezuela to its knees when the bust happened because it was so, in, it had such a big debt and had such disadjustments in its economy that it really started collapsing after the, the prices of oil dropped. And that was the beginning of the crisis that brought us to Hugo Chavez. And what happens with Hugo Chavez is the same thing because Hugo Chavez does not um, acknowledge that as a structural crisis. He thinks it was corruption that brought the end of the, the democracy in Venezuela and brought his election. He thinks that those guys were evil guys. And so he, since he was good, that wasn't going to happen to him. So that he did never acknowledge, he never put any responsibility in what had happened to the Venezuelans, but to his people or to himself. And so he re-edits the magical state and believes that now he can shape society according to his desires and to his, to his dreams. And his dreams were to shape us into a socialism of the 21st century. But this socialism of the 21st century was, was a personal utopia of Hugo Chavez Rios. It was not put forward by any social movement in Venezuela, from no political, relevant political actor, from no uh, his social organization. There, of course, we have radical left-wing groups, but they are not really, they weren't powerful in Venezuela, but this is much, much more. When Chavez decides to push us into socialism, into a socialist model, it, he really tries to do it according to what he thinks is socialism. And it is so severe, this, 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 this that I am saying, that he immediately calls to, to, to build, to, to constitute a presidential commission that will help him elaborate a constitutional reform to adjust the constitution of 1999 that he had, uh, he had uh, elaborated with his movement and his parties and so on. 
and with society through a national constituent assembly to adapt into a socialist model. And that commission cannot consult the people. It is a secret commission that only works with Chavez. And with Chavez pushes this, brings the constitutional reform to the national assembly, he will say orally, this is my personal project. This has been elaborated by me with my pen in my hand. And this is for the better of the Venezuelan people. This socialism of the 21st century, according to my, my students know, the constitution of 1999, uh, after it was discussed in the National Assembly and, and approved and even added some more articles to the constitutional reform, it had to be consulted with the people. And the people were consulted through a mandatory plebiscite in December of 2007, and the people said no. The people said, no, we don't want this reform of the constitution of 1999. But it seemed that Chavez wasn't hearing anymore, wasn't obeying the sovereign voice anymore because he was as the incarnated messiah of Venezuela, he knew better. And he decided to continue because the people were confused, did not understand, and they were better off with the project he was following. And so this is a project, basically a personal project of Chavez. And um, I would say also, that in this context of the magical state and of a personal, a personal project that has been refused by, by the, the sovereign voice of the people in December 2007, authoritarian starts opening its doors and moving faster in Venezuela, according to what the tendencies that sometimes are, are in potentially in populism. Uh, in, in, in the case of a petrol state and of a magical state, politics reigns supreme. There's no regard for the economy. We have enough money to do whatever we please. We can shape the, the society according to the world. So think the elites today with Chavez, when Chavez was alive, and before when Carlos Andres was alive. And we can even go to the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez, who also was going to convert us into the, the, the whole, uh, uh, one of the potencies, the uh, potencias of the Caribbean Sea through um, our modernization. So of course, now we have to talk about, I've been talking about this combination of frontier economy, uh, magical state. We have to talk about populism. What are we considering populism here? And how much is the contribution of populism, this way of doing politics to this, to this tragedy that Venezuela is living? Let's remember, from our literature, the literature that we have been studying, authors like Carlos de la Torre, like uh, Francisco Panizza, like Ernesto Laclo, the late debates that, we, that have been going on in Latin America about the concept of populism. And it is basically a way, to, a way of constructing political subjects in an antagonistic way. The discourse that, the, 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 that populism builds is a Manichaean discourse and where the society is split into two parts, the good ones and the evil ones, and where battles happen between the good and the evil and, 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 and go beyond the domestic into the realm of the, of the, of the, of the international and even universal uh, battlefields. This, uh, this uh, dichotomic discourse that builds these two antagonistic political subjects the people, the poor, the empowered, the, um, the just, the wise, the suffered people of the, of the populist leader uh, are, are fighting against those who are the blame that they are powerless and have all these grievances and unsatisfied demands. They because the blame to all this are the powerful, the oligarchs. Then the case of Venezuela at the beginning, it was, the, 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 the businessmen, the, the old political elites, as we moved into socialism of the 21st century and the second administration of Chavez, it became the bourgeoisie, the, um, the US empire, the government of Colombia, the, and the traders of fatherland. This simplifies politics, as Ernesto Lacro would say, has a great capacity to unite in, an, in, a, in a chain of unsatisfied demands uh, a whole set of all those demands and grievances of, of a fragmented society, and it has a great potential for mobilization. And behind Chavez mobilizes all those people with grievances and unsatisfied demands that pushes him 
to win the elections of 1998. This also, as we divide society in this way between the evil and the good, has brings the seeds for uh, an unequal, politically unequal society. Because if, you, if the, peop, the good people are on one side and the bad people are on the, are on the other side, then we are no more politically equal because we do not recognize the other one as a respectable rival. We recognize him as a powerful enemy in any case. We also see through Ernesto Laclau and other uh, authors um, that this, since these, these populist leaders enjoy great popularity in, in between the minorities, the excluded, the impoverished, or the poor of all ways, uh, they, they, they come to power through uh, elections, through universal suffrage. But it is, a, and in that sense, it is a kind of, of democracy and it is considered a direct form of democracy that, that has a top-down direction. It is orientated from the top by the leader or by the national executive or court state down towards those who follow them. And that has some peculiar characteristics that have very much um, been described in some kind of literature about Caesarism or, or Bonapartism in which they believe in the will of the majority as the voice, the sovereign voice of the people. Do not, um, they despect and reject pluralism. Once the majority has spoken, the rights of the minority do not exist. You have to obey. And in the case of populism, once the majority has selected the leader, the leader becomes an incarnation of the sovereign voice and of the general will, which is indivisible, and, and tries to, and, and relates to his followers through a direct way that rejects mediation and representative institutions, particularly the institutions of representative liberal democracy. In Latin America, the importance of the charismatic leader is very key to, to the situation. And in Venezuela, we are confronted with one of the most paradigmatic charismatic leaders of the region, the same as Perón in Argentina, the same as Gaitán in Colombia, Eliezer, Jorge Eliezer Gaitán, or maybe Velasco Ibarra in Ecuador. Here we are confronted with the, the populist leader in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez Frias, a military. We, if we go back to the Weberian theory, we, we see that Weber described very well the traits of the charismatic leader. He usually appears in times of distress and political breakdown. He, 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 he can advance a cohesion among those aggravated and has a great capacity to mobilize and to bring a political change. He, his legitimacy does not rest on the rule of law people allow him to bypass the norms and the law because they understand that he is an exceptional person. He has um, an average, above average intelligence and sometimes he's quasi divine. And if he, he, and he doesn't have to follow those rules and laws of the other people because he has come here to do great deeds and an epic kind of history of a beginning. The relations between the charismatic leader and his followers, as Weber explains to us, are not universal relations, neutral relations, as in the modern state. They are intimate, effective relations that demand loyalty and love. And one of the main traits that is important to, 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 to highlight is that charismatic leaders have no time for everyday economic deeds. They are in epics. They disregard the economy. That is not part of the of what they came to do. They came to save humanity or to save the poor in the case of Venezuela and to punish the, 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 the powerful of the Venezuela's democratic liberal institutions. And so it really, and if you put this together with the petrol state that didn't have also was very weak in its regard and, and evaluating a healthy economy, then you have that this was potentiated in Venezuela this idea that the economy doesn't matter and you put a military or you put an engineer, you put whoever as, as at the head of the economy because it really doesn't matter the economy or the laws of the economy. And if he uses the elections, the elections are used in a plebiscitarian logic to acc acclaim the leader or to reject him. And as this advances throughout the 14 to 13 years of Chavez's um, 
administrations, his two or three administrations, depend on how you want to interpret his, his, his the different periods where he went to elections. Um, this puts him above the institutions and makes it very difficult to have any kind of control over his will. What are the consequences for Venezuela? As, as populist entered into power and exercises, it entered through the liberal institutions as a representative liberal democracy. He won the elections with 54, 53% of the votes, if I don't recall badly. As he moved, he started to put in tension the institutions that were already weak and started as Stephen Levinsky and Daniel Sieblatt say in that wonderful book of how democracies die, they, he started eroding those institutions, particularly the judicial power and the legislative. And as he did this and how he implants in the state an official discourse of the bad guys and the good guys, the nationality in Venezuela, the nation begins to be divided because we are no more Venezuelans in equal conditions. There are Venezuelans that are more Venezuelan than others. So national identity begins to crumble in Venezuela. We don't know very, more, very much anymore what to be a Venezuelan means because what, what Chavez tried to impose from the state, from the official discourse, is that the Venezuelans are those that back his political project. Those are the real Venezuelans. The other ones are traitors to the fatherland. There's another consequence is the clear rejection of liberal representative democracy that once and again in all the discourses as is associated with the rich, with the powerful, with foreign interest, with, uh, with evil. And so checks and balances of disregard in public administration, plural party system is not necessary. These are values that are coming through the media, the sophisticated propaganda apparatus that the government has, political alteration doesn't matter. And all these, all these values that, that start happening in Venezuela and practicing in Venezuela as the abolition of checks and balances and the, 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 and the disregard for, for pluralism and alternation brings the, as a result that the, those who are governing Venezuela have complete impunity to do whatever they want because nobody can control them. And Chavez much less. Chavez is above the rule of law. Chavez is, uh, is, is a superman here, as maybe Nietzsche would have said. He is a man that is above every, everybody else. So we can be more or less, the, the followers of Chavez can be more or less alike, alike, but he is above all this. So this brings a huge impunity to all those who are governing. Besides that they are in those positions, not anymore because they have professions or experience or credits to be in those positions, but because they are loyal and they love Chavez and they have family ties or they are partners of the family of Chavez, the family of Nicolas Maduro, the family of all these, um, this military and civilian alliance that is governing. This is the perfect setting for the, pen, for the widespread of an, of an administration and efficiency which comes together with a widespread of corruption in Venezuela. And so corruption that was always there spreads and makes metastasis in, in, in all the administration at all the levels in Venezuela. And through this corruption, the penetration of the criminal, transnational criminal organizations takes place. And in some cases, even the, uh, the military groups uh, and the civilian groups that are in charge of the government of, in Venezuela start also transforming into criminal groups and have their and associate with illegal businesses of the transnational criminal organizations, such as the smuggling of diamonds, smuggling of coltan for, ma for many years, smuggling of oil, of gasoline, of, of, of um, regulated uh, foods, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, of narco, narco, narco businesses, the, 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 the trade of uh, cocaine. Another consequence is of course that the political equality and tolerance are eroded and, and, be, and it becomes more and more natural to punish the dissidents, to persecute it, to throw it in jail and to violate all their human rights. 
And, and, and as this continues, and as I say once and again, as the economy is not, the structural problems of the economy are not acknowledged in, in John Chavez's boom period and also during the bust period of Nicolas Maduro, the economy, the economy is simply disregarded and the crisis keeps on getting into the abyss. Very fastly, what could we say of socialism of the 21st century? That because this was not acknowledged, there were some ideas of what social, socialist economy was, but they never really were applied in Venezuela. There was never an effort, a real effort, to bring or to build some kind of socialist economy. Um, as Eric Hobsbawm, historian, would have said, really socialism lacks an economic model. And that's why social democracy is so important because it acknowledges, it recognizes the necessity of the markets, but it puts restrictions on that market to try to make the, the best of it. But in the case of, of the socialism of the 21st century, there were some ideas there, maybe in 2000, after the coup of, uh, of 2002 and the oil strike of 2003, 2004, but in 2004 become, begins the oil boom and everybody forgets about that because there's so many petrodollars floating into the economy that they just keep on doing the same the, the Venezuelan state has always done. That is to distribute that among the society as a way of legitimizing the system, the political regime. And in this case, to legitimize, legitimize the project, the personal project of socialist model of Hugo Chavez Frias. As he moves into the socialist model, he uh, more and more rapidly in second administration produces massive land expropriations, factory nationalizations, and it even neglects the oil company, postpones its investments, puts the oil company to open roads to import food, to import dresses, to give scholarships to children, and his employees uh, disregard the complex business of producing and, and trading oil to do activities that have nothing to do with their expertise or with their, um, their tasks. And in this, in, in this situation, industrialization is dismantled in Venezuela. Agriculture begins to recede. Um, it is more easy to import everything. There's a lot of dollars to do so. And so Charles would give money to, to say, to, to the corn producers to say something, but if the corn wasn't on time for the next election, he would import corn from the international market. And then the corn in Venezuela wouldn't find a place in the market and they would just, um, they, would, <laughs> they would just go bankrupt because the imports that had come in before them to so Chavez could win the next election had taken their place and they were in a better price. Things like that, all these distortions typical of a rentier extractivist economy with a Dutch disease. In social terms, what did socialism mean? It meant what the political project of Chavez said in 2007, what he called the first socialist plan for Venezuela in the supreme happiness. This is a very 1984 Orwell name of what the society was going to happen in Venezuela. It was going to be at the times of the supreme happiness well, the oil revenues would feed massively these personal social policies called missions that had as the goal to put a lot of money into the pockets of the people, especially those that had been excluded and that were poor, to give them the opportunity to go to the markets and to consume and to buy goods. And as they fulfilled and, and worked out of poverty, because of this, of the, of the distribution of the social income through the missions that were personal missions, they were not universal missions, they were not the state that was giving you a fellowship for your, for your child, it was not the state that was giving you um, uh, free uh, medical health care. No, it was Chavez that was giving it to you. He would give you that as a, as a particular favor of the charismatic leader in his concept that these were personal and effective and intimate relations. And so these social missions at the beginning, of course, resolve problems of poverty and a lot of people 
get out of poverty in the years of the oil boom to again fall into poverty as soon as the mission, as the, as the petrodollars dry out. And as the, the, the income is never enough to satisfy all the demands of a 30 million population, this distribution because becomes much more and more the source of clientelist circles that the populist leader and exercise of power in second administration builds up. In the first administration, he did, he did launch participatory uh, organizations that were trying to empower from, from the bottom up. But with the communal councils and the communes and all this, it was much more a matter of top down and to give you goods in exchange for your loyalty to Chavez and his socialist project. Uh, I must say also that in the project of socialism of the 21st century, uh, the organization, social organizations are not autonomous from the state. There is no such thing as a social society in, 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 in a socialist model like the Soviet Union or the Cuban model. So the communal state that Chavez tries to push and was denied in the plebis, in the mandatory plebiscite in 2007 was he was trying to construct parallel to, to the liberal democratic um, institutions that were in the 1999 constitution that still is in place, but that the government does not, does not obey. Um, he was building like a parallel state where the units were uh, were, uh, were to conform, were to shape what he called the communal state, a state where there weren't, it wasn't a matter of municipalities or parishes, municipalities, uh, federal state, but it was a matter of co uh, a community councils, communes, federations of communes and socialist cities, all this in a pyramid that was re-centralized by the national executive where there was no direct universal or secret suffrage. The people would gather in assemblies in their communal councils and would vote with their raised hand. There was a, there was a priority to, for the collective subject uh, confronted with the individual subject uh, with his human rights according to liberal representative institutions. There was no independence of the government branches, no pluralism, the communal councils or the communes were not pluralist. They had to build the socialist project that was being elaborated in the centralized planification of the state. And there would be no alternatives, alternatives in office. The consequences of this populism and this socialism that the economic and the social socialist models depend on the continuous and increasing oil revenue. Since 2013, that revenue collapsed, diminished, and as it collapsed, the GDP of the economy started shrinking, inflation set in until it became hyperinflation, unemployment, scarcity of goods, and a sharp poverty, like I said, that has brought more than 90% of the families in Venezuela. Are powered, are powered by, uh, are poor by income. Uh, socialism came in and made matters worse with all the regulations on all stages of the production and distribution of goods that if anything they did was to deepen the crisis that we had lived in the 80s and the 90s. And in, in the terms of the political model, the socialism of the 21st century really was a project that Chavez had promised to be different than the socialism of the 20th century, but it, as he died and became ill and died, it became a, a bad replica of the Soviet Union and the Cuban model. But it is, it, it is, in, it is a bad replica because it doesn't have some of the advantages that, these, that those models had in the 20th century. So it, doesn't, it, it, it inflicts severe restrictions on individual rights to favor the people as a collective subject. It destroys liberal democratic institutions like the checks and balances and pluralism and alternation. It persecutes and, and the universal suffrage, which they don't believe, they think it's a bourgeoisie to have fair elections. It persecutes all political dissidents and this and controls the media with a very sophisticated propaganda apparatus that controls today the information that most of the Venezuelans receive from through the TV, through the radio. 
And this, of course, this is my point that once Chavez lost that plebiscite in 2007, where the sovereign voice told them that he could not, that they weren't, that they had, that they rejected this model, Chavez could not more rely really on elections, on fear of elections to have his way. So he started relying more and more on his charisma and on his money. And by doing so, the, the, the tendencies of authoritarianism of his popular way of exercising power just got deeper and deeper. Notwithstanding this that I say, I do believe that Chavez won his elections even until 2012. So he had a legitimacy through elections and that made him more a competitive authoritarianism than an authoritarian regime, but it had, at the end, it was, had had very strong authoritarian traits. And what he leaves as a legacy in Venezuela is an authoritarian regime headed by his successor, appointed by him in December of 2012 by MTV. When he says, if something happens to me, this is my successor. He points it out with his little finger as if he were some kind of Jesus Christ or something, or king or something, and points out who his successor is and says, but uh, Nicolas Maduro will win a very um, unfair election. And, and Chavez will die in March 13 of 2013. Maduro will uh, have to go to elections and will win those elections, but he will win with a very slim margin of 1.3 having abused that electoral process in all ways. I want to just say that elections is very important for a populist leader. Chavez did not believe in fair process, electoral processes. He always cheated on them. He always used it with public resources were, which were illegal by Venezuela's constitution and laws. He used it, all the public resources in his favor, but he used to win with 20 points of, uh, above his, his rival with 10 points, 15 points, it was very clear that he was backed by the majority. But this is not the case of Nicolás Maduro starting in 2003, because doing all that cheating, he only wins by 1.4%, what may put a big question mark if he really had won those elections. And some people say that even at that moment, he began to, that those elections could have been fraudulent. This is something that I cannot answer, but I do say that his legitimacy since the first presidency was very, very weak, not only for all Venezuelans, but also for Chavismo that didn't kind of convince themselves that he was really the replacement of Hugo Chavez. I call this last pattern, with this I am finishing, Nicolás Maduro from populism to dictatorship. Because what, and this is a photo a characteristic of the authoritarianism with totalitarian traits that we live today in Venezuela. This is a member of the special squad that Nicolás Maduro uh, constituted two years ago to give security in the shanty towns of Venezuela. But the, the other function is to prove terror to, to and con social control over the population, knowing Chavismo that today it is a minority and that is, there is no way it can win any kind of election nor can control the society if it's not through terror and fear and repression. For the, it is very unfortunate for, for Nicolás Maduro that when Chávez dies, he is a successor that has no charisma. You know, as Max Weber would say, charisma is not transferable. You cannot inherit Chávez's charisma. He was not a charismatic, he is not a charismatic man. And that is anybody telling you that he's charismatic, you can tell them that that's a lie. He was not a charismatic man. And for his unfortunate, also the prices of oil start dropping. Chavez enjoyed 10 years of oil prosperity. As soon as Maduro swore into office, the price starts dropping. So to sustain this socialist model and to say to continue the populist legacy of Chavez, the two big pillars that Chavez had in his second administration, his charisma and his money have disappeared. So with what do you replace these, these sources of legitimacy? Uh, well, you will start, it, it, there has been a big effort during the, this second stage of Chavismo 
to legitimize the, the, the government through a neo-patrimonial source, through this idea that we are the children of Chavez, that we have the right to rule because Chavez told us, uh, left us here to interpret his legacy. We loved him, we understood him, we, we can interpret his legacy and we have the right to rule on our own rights. And of course we can go into, I call it neo patrimonial because we can use some, we can use electoral elections, but that is not our main source. Our main source is that we are the descendants. We, we are those successors, those, those who inherit the legacy of the savior, of the fa fa founding father of this country, which was Hugo Chavez. And this is this civilian and military alliance that used to surround Chavez now closes circles around Nicolás Maduro. But as the money diminishes and socialism isn't that attractive as it was in the past, and Nicolás Maduro cannot convince anybody that this is really, that he is really giving us benefits, any kind of tangible material benefits. And so more and more, as he advances in his first administration from 2013 to 2018, it is more and more clear that Chavismo has become a minority and that it can only rely more and more in an authoritarian and militaristic regime with neo-patrimonial and, and with tendencies to become a sultanic regime. I will come in for that to end. This is part of some of the efforts to convert Chavez into some kind of founding father, quasi divine father in Venezuela. This is where his tomb that is in a little mountain in the west side of Venezuela, where he is accompanied by the two different versions of Simon Bolivar, the classic and the mulatto version that he invented. And this little mountain is in the west side of Venezuela, looking from the mountain to the presidential palace in order to check uh, Nicolas Maduro and see if he is going doing the things right. This is the altar that is outside. These are photos that I took six months after he died. I went to see him and I wanted to see what, the, what was going around. And this is a popular altar with, outside where he is now, Chavez, accompanied by Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the Negro Felipe, and other syncretic figures of the popular religion in Venezuela. This is one of the, of the flyers of the elections in which Maduro won. And link him very strongly with Hugo Chavez because his legitimacy, his main source of legitimacy was that Chavez had appointed him with his finger. But as I say, Venezuelans were maybe modern enough and did not buy this bargain. They uh, more and more were disenchanted. They did not see the benefits of backing um, Nicolas Maduro and this patrimonial regime authoritarian that was in the building. And so they started rejecting them. And in 2015, uh, for the parliamentary elections of that year, the opposition won overwhelmingly those elections and caught the part the control over all majorities of the parliament. And so Chavismo under Nicolas Maduro's leadership acknowledged that it had become a minority and that probably it could not win anymore any election. And so it sustainably started not, not eroding, but abolishing any kind of liberal representative institutions and any kind of democracy. And I would say that the legitimacy as the legacy of Chavez has not worked. The patrimonial testamental legacy that Max Weber would say is a source of legitimacy also, it has not worked for the majority of the people. And so what today we have is a dictatorship, uh, a, a, a group of, of civilians and military that govern Venezuela, not because they are legitimate, but because they have the force to do it. They are above the law. They do not rule by the law, rule of law or, not, or nor by any real inst institutional framework. They rule because they, they have built together with their allies, the Cubans, vast repressive military police and intelligence machinery that includes armed civilians and criminal groups to create fear and control the citizens. 
They also have been developing, and this comes from the Chavez era since 2002, 2003, a very powerful, sophisticated apparatus of propaganda, what is called the public media, but it really is propaganda, government uh, media to assure that the information that the Venezuelans hear is the official information and a very totalitarian tendency to give the Venezuelans as much lies as possible and as big as they can be so that we can believe that we are living in the best of the worlds. And it is also Maduro in these late last, last years, I would say, is sustained by the powerful, powerful allies like Russia, China, and Cuba. Also Turkey a little bit, Iran also, and some other uh, of the club of authoritarianisms that, that reign in the world. But it, it is, uh, these, these powers have a certain limit, I would say, and they have their own interests, I would say. And of course, we have also uh, commanding and including in these in this, in, in this uh, coalition of forces, we have the transnational criminal organizations and the guerrilla movements, violent guerrilla movements of Colombia that are also backing his permanence in power. My final comments would be the following. This kind of regime that is clearly an authoritarian regime that has totalitarian traits, and it also has sultanic tendencies. Sultanic tendencies, according to um, Juan Linz and Alfred Stefan in those books published in the 90s of Transition and Consolidation of Democracy spoke of non-authoritarian modern regimes where the authoritarianism was so extreme that the uncertainties over, uh, over the society was so great for the people because the central government, the chief uh, uh, penetrated all the spheres of life, took decisions under a discretional uh, logic that you never knew really what was, is, if, if there was any kind of legal security or, or policy fit that could be changed from one day to the other, where violence is common, where paramilitaries are, 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 uh, scare the people, all these, these are traits that Maduro has and has been having in the late, with its ups and downs it has been having. And, and, and I want to, I bring it in to, to finish this, this this conference or this class because Alfred Stefan and Juan Linz looked through a whole set of experiences of, of non-authoritarian modern uh, regimes and came up with this idea that in this kind of extreme authoritarianism, a democratic peaceful transition is very difficult. It is full of obstacles because the society has collapsed. It is so weak the fragmentation, the persecution of any kind of dissidence is so strong, the cruelty, the uncertainties of, the, of, of those in power is so great that it makes very difficult for the domestic sources to put together a front in order to oppose a, a, a regime of these, of these characteristics. They also say there in, that, in, in, in this article about non-democratic uh, modern regimes that negotiations usually fail and the coup d'etats are, 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 are not viable either because the, the, the armed forces usually, of course, they are, they're looking at empirical uh, data. Of course, this, the, the, this is not always the case, but, but it is usually the case that the armed forces is also has been weakened, fragmented, divided. And that is true for the armed forces in Venezuela that have suffered several reforms to adapt to a Cuban kind of model you have to think that the armed forces in Venezuela is no more a Western armed force, is an armed force that has other concepts and is fragmented and it does not have that chain of hierarchies that is vertical. And that if you, if, if you convince the high, uh, the high commands, everybody will obey. That is not the case in Venezuela. It's much more fragmented, more difficult. And Juan Linz would say that this makes also difficult the success of a military coup. And so what they say in their essay on these non-democratic modern regimes is that you have to wait for an unexpected or violent way out. And that that is, has been the most common. This is not the case, I think, in Venezuela where opposition forces have been struggling now for more than four years to find a way out through elections, through peaceful, peaceful means, through negotiations. 
But they also say that in this kind of, of, of political order, the international community plays very key roles to produce the, not only to produce the fall of such kind of non-democratic regime, but especially to guarantee a peaceful and democratic transition. So I will end here. I have some photos that we can see later. A part of, the, of this neopatrimonial regime is the validity of nepotism. This is some this is the case of the family of Chavez and the family of Nicolás Maduro and his wife. His wife had, when she was president of the National Assembly, put to put jo gave jobs to 47 of the, of the family. And of course, Chavez's family has had all kinds of political positions. These are some of the images of the political violence. And um, this is a persecution of one of the deputies in the cycle of protests in 2017. He is today in jail. This is the union leader, uh, Ruben Gonzalez, a very respectful and very recognized union leader of the south part of Venezuela, Ferro Minera. He is in jail too, and actually his family has been asking Maduro to, to, say, to let him leave. He is completely unjustly in prison, and he has been having kidney failures, and he has been having a hypertension, and he may be, uh, at the, his life is in great risk at this moment. And I will end, so this is a very typical photo of Maduro as the chief of a military regime, territorial like kind of army. This is the Minister of Defense. The other one on the other side is the woman that was Minister of Defense before him. And I want to end with this photo. This is a paramilitary, a very famous paramilitary in Venezuela. He is the chief of the colectivo. His name is Valentin Santana. The colectivo is called La Piedrita. If you have time and want to go to YouTube, you can see a video of him. There was a rally going on, I think it was in 2018. And um, he was, he, they put this video of him saying that how he defends the constitution, how he defends the revolution with all his people armed with these masks on their face and all the authorities of the city of Caracas coming to hug him and to say hello to him. This man has at least three indictments for sides, but nobody would touch him because he is backing Nicolas Maduro and the fans of the, the, the regime of Maduro. Thank you so much. I am finishing with this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lopez Maya. So um, we are gonna take uh, questions now. Give me one second here so I can start reading you the questions that have already come in um, from our audience. Cole asked, should socialism have any space or role in today's world? Chavez was a total mess. Was it due to a lack of socialism or a love for power? How many questions do you have there? One, two, three. About five or six right now. Give me two or three if I can put them together. Okay, so um, again, so socialism have any space or role in today's world? Um, Chavez was a mess, was it because he lacked socialism or a love for power? So that's the first question. Um, the next question is, uh, why do you think the Venezuelan political model was so appealing for governments like the former president Evo Morales from Bolivia? Um, and a follow up to that question was, how do you think this political model put in place in Bolivia and Venezuela was similar or different? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, those are, are very connected so we can go together. Okay. One of the things I would say that I have no doubt that Chavez was a left-wing uh, leader. He believed in socialism. He, well, he actually wanted to um, reform Venezuela to deepen Venezuela's democracy. Deepening Venezuela's democracy was a very left-wing discourse of the 90s. However, um, I do believe too that Chavez was, as I talked about the, the magical state, as he went into power and was confronted by all the obstacles that uh, power groups in Venezuela had, political parties, opposition parties, that confronted him even in a violent way, he began 
becoming more and more relied on his populist uh, exercise, his populist way of doing power, convinced that he had come to battle against evil. The other thing I would say to complement that is that I take two things more to complement this. Is this socialism or not? One thing I would say is that the, the constitution that he pushed, pushed forward in 1999 is not a socialist constitution. It is a participative constitution. It is a constitution that has liberal democratic institutions in place, but it has mechanisms of direct democracy. Many of them from, with a logic from the bottom up to try to empower Venezuelan society in order to control that state that had been the motive of so many abuses on the part of the elites in the 80s and the 90s. So he radicalizes in his second term. And I think he radicalizes because um, of the confront political confrontation that he had and that he survived, but he, he, he became a very distrusted person towards the Venezuelans, particularly towards entrepreneurs, the Catholic church, the professionals, the intellectuals, the middle classes. And so he radicalized, but also because he had so much money after 2004 that he thought any risk could be taken because he had enough money to um, fulfill what he desired. You know, there's a, a, a nice essay of Wurt Keilan about the radicalization that happens after 2004 due to the cycle of the boom and the bust of the resources. But Venezuela has the typical resource curse. And um, after 2004, this 10 year spread boom of oil prices radicalizes Chavez that thinks he can do whatever he wants. He is popular. He has won the elections of 2006 with 64% of the votes. He says, well, I've got it all. I've got money, I've got popularity. I've got the control of the state. I have eroded the judiciary. I'm in control of the National Assembly. I radicalize. I think that this radicalization, as Kurt Weiland said, took place also in Ecuador with Rafael Correa, which also has a constitution that is not a radical constitution, and with Evo Morales in Bolivia, which also has in place a constitution that, is, um, that combines liberal representative democracy institutions with participatory institutions like the Venezuelan and even adds something that they call communitarian institutions that's supposed to be of some kind of democratic institutions of the indigenous people. But the three of them radicalized from there due to fact maybe their charisma and this tendency that uh, the, 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 the resource purse has that you feel that you are so powerful because you have so much money, you can do whatever you want with, with the society. I think Kurt Weiland has a point there, but it is, I think the most extreme case is, is Venezuela. So this extremism is uh, in an extremism inside a left-wing tendency. But having said that, it's very different. From, it is different from Ecuador and it's different from Bolivia. Bolivia never uh, went into the extremes of disregard the economy like Hugo Chavez did. It was also always a uh, caution with regard because they had lived already hyperinflation. They were a poor country. They knew what it was, the hardships of the economy. And besides everything, you must remember that the leader also marks very much what the kind of populist leadership is going to be. And Evo Morales is not a military man. The militaries are parasites in economy. He was a union leader. He was something very different from a, a, a military that was Hugo Chavez and different from an economist that was Rafael Correa. So I think those things bring nuances here, even though the three cases have similarities and, they, and all of them talk in the name of socialism in the 21st century. And they, especially Evo Morales, admired very much Hugo Chavez. I think something happened with socialism and with the left wing in, the, in, in Latin America. And it was that it suffered with these populist leaders an involution. I think that we had very interesting debates in the 80s and the 90s, especially after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. And very recently, somebody put in, in the internet 
a conference of Juan Carlos Portantiero, for example, that was a very prominent Argentinian leader, uh, intellectual. And he was talking in the 90s, and he was talking about the, the failures of socialism of the 20th century. He was talking about the importance of the market. He was talking about we shouldn't be ashamed of being social democrats. He was really giving, and Juan Carlos Portantiero is undeniable, a left-wing man, intellectual, one of those that the left-wing used to call organic intellectual, intellectuals. And so I think that what happened with the left, like for example, in Claxo, that is so backward and that went back to the Stalinist times where the market was criminalized and stigmatized, and that you have to be a planned center state socialism, that is the case of Hugo Chavez. So I think we have to examine that. I think that socialism, as it was, is, is, will always be a, a, a kind of a, a theory that, uh, or ideology that can and look for balances between market and state regulations that looks always to put the, the, the emphasis in taking poverty, uh, combating poverty, um, bringing more equality and more liberty to, to, to the people, especially to those more vulnerable in society, but that um, it, it has to revise this terrible times that it has lived in these last decades. Um, <clears throat> but I think I, I have said, I have answered those, those three questions here. Okay, so um, Eduardo Alvarez has a, a comment um, in Espanol. Toda la conversión de corrupción hacia el narco estado entró manejada por Cuba y gente entrenada en la isla. En Venezuela no crearon nada, no tenían ideas nuevas, solo impuestas de afuera. Do you want me to ask you another question after that or answer that first? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Sofia de la Cruz asks, wouldn't Chavez have to be corrupt to choose such a corrupt successor? Or could he have just made the decision without knowing what Maduro would do? Why would he choose Maduro if he lacks charisma? Okay. Okay, well, these two questions. The first thing I would say, I, a, a corruption of the military with um, narco, with um, drug trafficking is prior from Chavez. Of course, we have the borders with, uh, the, with, with Colombia, which has always been a temptation because our territory is, is, a, is a way out of uh, the cocaine that is produced and, and, and produced in, in, in Colombia. Or some, in, in many cases, the crops also are grown in Colombia. And it started in the 90s. And I don't think it's, it's uh, I don't think that Cubans taught us how to do that. I think that the military was, were persuaded to get into the business because it was a very lucrative business. Um, when Chavez comes into power, Chavez changes uh, the, the, the way the Venezuelan state looked at the, 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 the guerrilla movements in Colombia. Uh, they had been looked as, as enemies. The armed forces in Venezuela had to defend the territory against these guerrilla movements that were uh, doing warfare to the Colombian government in Colombia. And they had to protect Venezuela from these territories. But Chavez will change that because Chavez is, finds himself uh, with sharing an ideology with the FARCs. And the FARCs are in the drug business. They are in the kidnapping business and the drug business. And so Chavez changes are a way of um, relating to FARC and, and, and Maduro with the ELN, or maybe Chavez too, I don't have that information. And so the ties between the, the, these, the, the military in Venezuela and the guerrilla movement, the FARC and the ELN, of course, pass through these very lucrative businesses and this widespread corruption that is going on because the farts live on kidnapping and live on drug trafficking. And so little by little, they bring the military into that, some civilians also. And of course, then Venezuela's territory is opened to, because it is the National Guard, it is the military in Venezuela who is supposed to protect the territory of Venezuela, but they are being paid by the different groups 
in Colombia and afterwards even from Mexico to let the, the, the trade of drug trafficking pass. With the years also, other things are also, they also, uh, Chavez also did something that the Venezuelan government had not done until that time. That was, he would put some military to negotiate with the FARC some of the kidnappings that they used to do in Venezuela's territory. This, the Venezuelan government had refused to do that before, but Chavez decides to, to back, uh, to give some support to those families that have people that have been kidnapped by the FARC and brings in Rodriguez Chacin that is going to be um, the governor of the Guarico state. And he is going to negotiate with the FARC. And I can imagine that his, the, of the two businesses it was much more lucrative the drug business and the kidnapping business. And so they, they, get in, they get involved and get more and more corrupted until in some moment they decide that maybe they can. They don't have, they don't need to depend on, on, the, on the lords in Colombia. They can also have their own, their own lords. And this is a very obscure uh, story. We don't have too much information about this, uh, reliable information. It's not easy to, 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 to have, uh, to trust the information that you have, but there are some very serious information going on. Uh, what is the, the, the role of Cuba here? Well, I think it is a, an ideology that says that if you corrupt the empire, that, that is the work to help socialism reign in the world. As you can see, Paulo Escobar had, had been businesses with Cuba and Nicaragua. And I think this was the idea also that permitted, that gave permission to Chavez and, and of course to Maduro and not to his military that are completely involved in drug trafficking as the state, uh, uh, as the Department of Justice has shown from many, some, from some of them, of some of the military there and that, that we saw with the, with the nephews of President Nicolas Maduro and Celia Flores that are serving an 18 year sentence here in Florida. Um, they, convinced themselves that they were doing a good thing because they were destroying the, the evilness of the empire by inside, just like the British put in opium, you know, in China at the beginning of the 20th century, they were put in the cocaine to, 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 to corrupt the society of the United States. I think that's more the role of the Cubans there than they really are the ones that, that advise them. I think that, 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 that I don't know, I, I, that the information that I have that I have studied or systematized says like otherwise. Uh, what else did he say? Why did he choose Maduro's success? And many people ask that and, and it's kind of, um, in a way it's kind of uh, surprising, yes. But if you come to think of it, I think Chavez was ill since 2011. He died in 2013, but as he was found with cancer, I think that the Cuban regime took over the government of Venezuela. They became the main advisor of Hugo Chavez. I don't think Chavez would, had all his consciousness and was gov governing during those two years where he was under treatments in, in Cuba. That is one thing. And so the influence of the Cuban regime here, I think to, in the picking of Nicolas Maduro, I think is important to, to, to acknowledge. The second thing I think would be int interesting to know is that not only um, Nicolas Maduro was a trained left-wing leader, he, he came from Liga Socialista uh, and, and I think some other, and, and he was a union leader, uh, a left-wing union leader, not a too good one, but he, I mean, he had some training in Cuba when he was young, but above all, he was the chancellor, he was the foreign minister of Chavez starting 2007, if I don't recall well, he had been six years being foreign minister, a foreign minister of Chavez. And during all those years, of course, when, when Chavez named him, he didn't, he, he, I mean, he had no training to be a foreign minister. He had no knowledge of the international relations. He spoke Spanish. He didn't speak any other language. He was a very, very, he, I mean, he, he has high school. He's not a professional. And so Chavez didn't care about that because as, as I say, he, what he wanted was loyalty. But he did align Venezuela's foreign policy with Cuban foreign policy. And so I think that the Cubans knew Nicolás Maduro very well and they, we trusted Nicolás Maduro. 
they did not trust any military, I think, especially Diosdado Cabello. Diosdado Cabello had never been to Cuba before the, the, the illness of uh, Hugo Chavez. The first time he goes to, to Cuba was in December of 2012, when, when after the, the last treatment of Hugo Chavez, and some people say that when he died, Hugo Chavez at the end of December of 2012. In any case, he was not not a man that was trusted by the Cubans. So I think that he was chosen because he was their man in Caracas, <laughs> to say it in some way. They trusted him. They thought they could use him. They thought that they had influence on him. And, um, and he was, uh, was a person that um, had come from a left-wing kind of um, career, which was not the case. And the military really are nationalists. They, they are not socialists. The military, they were sort of military. The ones that were trained in during democracy were not socialist. Today it's different because it's many years now that they had to go to Cuba to have training. Okay, if there's anything else, if, and if we have time. Yes, sorry. Um, why is Maduro bringing the country to a boiling point? They know it's time to leave. Is it to make it impossible to manage for the coming leader? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? One more. Um, have there been any cases that you know of where international accountability has been established or somehow imposed without one country exercising unjust power over another? Okay, okay, let me see if I can answer that one. Why doesn't he leave? Because the cost of leaving power for, for the military in Venezuela are very high. Um, they are enjoying a lot of privileges. They have enriched themselves in a proportion you really don't even know. And two weeks ago, uh, uh, for the first time, really a systematized uh, investigation about all the companies that the Minister of Defense and the High Commander of the Social Security of the National Security of Defense of Venezuela, all the companies that they have um, created to do businesses with the Venezuelan state, they have appropriated the Venezuelan state and used the Venezuelan state for private businesses. They have all sorts of businesses today. Uh, they have all sorts of privileges. They are in all, some of them are converted into criminal groups. They are multimillionaires. You can go into the internet, you can go on YouTube and see these parties that they have. And all this brings them to have a lot of interest around Nicolás Maduro. They know that if Nicolás Maduro falls, they will fall with him. And, and all these privileges and all these businesses and all this power, they are the key ministers in Maduro's um, cabinet. They have eight or 10 governorships. They have mayorships. They are in the key inst institutes in Venezuela. They are ruling the country. And so the cost for them to leave is very high. They will. They would have to sacrifice all this for the for the common good or for the good of the Venezuelans. And I really, at this point, don't believe they really care about the Venezuelan people. If they would have cared about the Venezuelan people, they would have already left. But they really don't care. They are more concerned about their safetyness, their privileges. They many of them have been now sanctioned as individuals. Their properties, some of their properties have been the ones that they had in the United States have been frozen. Some of them are being persecuted in international court, and not in the international court, in US courts. Example, for example, of the interior minister, Reverol. He has an open uh, uh, case in New York. Uh, he, he, he has been accused of using his position when he was in the Department of Anti-Narcotics in Venezuela to protect the, the drug trafficking of the country and to enrich in reciprocity for enrichment for money. These people really can have, until now, I think they have not seen what is the benefit of leaving the country, of leaving power. 
And so they, Maduro just, and Maduro I think is convinced together with his wife and with the Rodriguez brother and sister and others of the, of the, of the small circle that governs today Venezuela. I don't think the decisions are taken by more than six or seven persons today. Uh, they are convinced that if they leave power, they will be killed. And so they prefer to, to die in power. I think that is the reason of, um, that they sit in the negotiation tables just to, to, to try to, to gain some time, try to, to make believe that they are negotiating. Um, they offer things on the negotiation table, but they really, as soon as they see a little opportunity to stand up and to leave, they stand up and leave. They do not have the idea, as I showed before, of their model of socialism, that sharing power is, is something that they believe in. They don't believe in that. They don't believe in, in their ideology. Pluralism has no, 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 no space. I am talking about the high commands. They are very much um, united, protecting and defending uh, Nicolas Maduro because they are defending their privileges. They are defending their lives. They are defending their family. They don't see, I think at the moment, an option for them. And I don't think, honestly, that at this point, they're much more afraid of losing their properties and riches and fortunes and families than they are of saving the Venezuelan people. As to, um, if I, I'm not familiar with the international justice cases, but I do believe that, for example, transitional justice has happened in, in some countries in successful ways, for example, in Argentina, in South Africa, and in other countries. And so I think it is possible that Venezuela can, once we find that, that door that opens to the corridor of a, of, a, of a peaceful transition, measures of transitional justice will have to be implemented in order to bring back uh, some norms of peaceful living among the Venezuelan people, because today we have a society that is completely destroyed. We don't even have clearly a nation. Uh, even nationality and republic have been destroyed. And so the state hardly um, has any kind of functions today, except controlling the population and the army, more or less controlling the territory, but really to guarantee our life, to guarantee peaceful living to guarantee uh, education, security, uh, and physical integrity. We don't have any of those functions. So what we are looking in the future is a very hard path to uh, recover a nation state if we're going to recover it. I hope we do. I don't see any other way to coming back to our feet. And I must say that it is going to be uh, and I will come back to what I said at the beginning. We have a structural problem that has not been resolved. We have to now that the price of oil has gone down. Today, they said that the price of Venezuelan oil is being sold at six dollars a barrel. It, it cost about fourteen or fifteen to take it out of the wells and put it in the ports. So, we Venezuela as an oil country is as a rentier economy has finished. And so it's not that we overcame our structural problem. The problem destroyed us because we never resolved this. We never resolved it. And so now the great challenge of the generations of Venezuelans that want to rebuild this country is to address the challenge of building a sane, healthy economy that can give us prosperity, that can guarantee to fulfill the food that we put on our tables, fulfill the basic human rights that we deserve. But this is, um, this is something that until now has been very difficult to accomplish. I don't know if there's anything else. I think we are almost ending this session. Is there anything else, Patricia? We have one final question if you wanna tackle that. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so the last question is from Oswaldo and he asks, what is your reading on the political future of Venezuela and what would be the role of the current situation with COVID-19 in this process? Well, 
COVID-19 couldn't come to Venezuela in a worse moment. Uh, now for, as I say, the complex humanitarian emergency in Venezuela was declared by the United Nations in 2017. So we are already three years into that humanitarian crisis without a resolution. And that includes the collapse of the health system. I did put some, some numbers that you can find them at, in the, the documents of the high, of the office of the high commission of um, Michel Bachelet that was in Caracas last year and was able to have, which has an extensive data of the situation in the health sector. But I did put um, some of the, of, the, of the data that has been out by the by some of the NGOs of the health sector that have been working to denounce, to register, and to try to protect the Venezuelan people. And it is that the hospitals lack any kind of capacity to address uh, the situation of the COVID-19. They don't have enough equipment. There are like a, a total of six beds in all the country, the therapies are not working, the machines are not working. But there are certain things that may help Venezuela, or have been helping Venezuela. Here it is. I just put the death toll in the public hospitals last year that was above 1,500 death tolls because of the failures of supplies in the hospitals. These are the main state hospitals because the surveys is not so extensive as to cover all the hospitals in the nation. But um, some of them, because you get in with a heart attack, there's no way you, they, can, they can put you on a machine. There's, there's no way for the, to, to get you um, any kind of intense therapy and so on. But uh, having said that, I mean, Venez Venezuelans are completely unprotected and there is no such thing as the public health sector has practically virtually um, lacks all kinds of of uh, capacities to address. If Germany has it addressed it but that way in France and England, you can imagine the situation in Venezuela. But there are certain things that I would, I would point out. As a dictatorship, uh, Maduro closed the airports very, very early. Venezuela was already very isolated. Uh, many of the airlines was, were, are not flying to Venezuela now for two or three years. The American United Air, American Airlines, Delta, they, they're not flying for a long time now. And from the Europeans, um, how do you call it? Uh, Iberia is not flying. Um, uh, the Colombian uh, Avianca is not flying. There's many, many airlines that are not flying. Actually, Venezuela was very isolated. And so that has helped to slow the entry in Venezuela. Maduro very early closed the airports, has declared already now a month of quarantine, has declared another month. And, um, and of course he um, enforces that through, through, through military and repression to put the people inside their houses. Not that the people are obeying completely because this is a great dilemma for the people that are starving that they have to go out every day to try to find food. But uh, it, this has, in, in a certain way, slower the entry of the illness in Venezuela. We don't have clear numbers of what is going on because this is a dictatorship. The information has been considered as secret of state. That's the way the governor of the state of Sulia put it at the beginning of March. Uh, you cannot give information. Actually, there have been doctors that have gone to prison and journalists that have been thrown into jail because they have given some information about this. And this is a, a, a very much a society today of fear. And so we, we really don't have very clear what the numbers are. We also have other additional information about COVID and is that the Chinese have been helping in bringing equipments and uh, sets for testing that the United States, USAID has brought in some planes too with the help of, of, of I think, Colombia. Um, that um, other supplies have been coming in of humanitarian um, help. But we really, the experts say 
that we are looking for a very dramatic situation probably at the end of May. But the uncertainty is we really don't have enough information to know what is going on. Um, I have heard of the death of some people. I have heard of some people that have been, um, that have died in Caracas. In the interior, the situation is much more confusing, but it also is much more isolated. There is no gasoline for the ambulances or to move uh, patients or to move emergencies. So I would tell you that um, it's very uncertain, but if a wave comes upon Venezuela, like it happened in Spain, or like it happened in, in other countries like the US, the tragedy is above everything. I just read an interview of an expert in agricultural matters in Venezuela that says that probably we are losing, we are going to lose the major part of the crops in Venezuela this year because this is the time to sow corn and to sow rice and to sow some of the vegetables. And they're not being done because we don't have money to import the needs that they have because this, in the case of the vegetables and so on, some of them that were produced cannot go out and they're being rotten nearby their fields because there's no gasoline to bring them to the, to the cities. So I, will, I, I am very worried about that situation. I think that um, I don't see why it, Venezuela would be saved of, of, a tra of a further tragedy in this case. But of course, the rhetoric of the government is that he has controlled the situation, that uh, the last days he has had zero cases, that uh, he has all the, that he has more, he has said to more people than the Germans and things like that. So when you have a totalitarian speech like that from the national executive, and then you don't have really reliable information inside. The doctors tried to give you information, but some of them have gone to jail because of that. It's, it's, it's difficult to really know, but what experts say is that it's coming in slowly. It has been controlled because there has been a very severe closing of, this, of the country that, and that the country was very much isolated before that. But, and, that they, and that the people that are trying to come in Venezuela, the Venezuelans that are trying to come back have been isolated in terrible conditions in the borders. So they probably will be dying in the Colombian borders or in the Venezuelan borders. Okay. Okay, there are no more questions. If you have any final comments, uh, Dr. De La Torre or Dr. Lopez. Yes, uh, I wanted to, first of all, thank Patricia for helping us to put this together and, for Marga and to Margarita for this incredible overview of the history of Venezuela that encompass the economy, politics, and, and the different ways in which this whole concatenation of an authoritarian utopia with the reliance on oil without thinking about any other solutions led to this incredible humanitarian crisis. And so I really appreciate and we have learned a lot, Margarita, and thanks for everything. And to all of you who attended, thanks so much. We will keep you informed of other events that we will continue to have during the summer related to coronavirus, but other issues that are happening in Latin America. Thanks so much. And I just finished saying, I thank you also, all of you for having hearing. And I hope this is useful because I I know the information of Venezuela is very polarized and that it is not easy to have reliable information, data, or sources uh, in order to understand the developing tragedy that is happening in my country. Thank you so much for attending this speak, this talk. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, Dr. Lopez Maya, everybody is um, thanking you for such useful information that you have provided and shedding light on this. Um, important context. Uh, so with that said, we'll stop our live stream. Thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. <laughs>